Hello YouTube, I'm PCJ Law, and these are my 6 quick tips for growing big cities fast and early on Civilization 5. Growing big cities fast and early helps get you off to a strong start, compete for world wonders and get your cities through their production queue. However, not growing enough early on leaves you in a situation I like to call chasing the game, where in fact poor cities can actually do really well if you grow them enough early on, and good cities can be a total liability right up until the end game if you don't grow them enough early. Today we have a demonstration game of this with Mongolia, where we have two situations, one on screen, where I grew the cities early, and the other, which we're going to switch to later on, where growth wasn't given enough attention. The end result we'll actually end up seeing is quite stark. Anyway, as always, this guide will aim to give tips that work effectively on deity difficulty, however this guide in particular is relevant to all difficulty levels. Now, these aren't meant as super pro tips, more intermediate level I would say, but when used properly they are more than enough for consistent strong growth on any map with any civ and more than enough for deity difficulty. Anyway, just before we kick off, for reference, turn timings are all quick speed unless specified and we'll frame this all in terms of deity timings but we'll try and demonstrate how timings differ on lower difficulties. So, to start we should review the key mantras of a strong empire in Civilization 5. One, population is science and science wins games but also population is production and production makes winning games easier. So for today we're going to talk about the growth window and how it's better to grow during one specific period. Two, growth tiles and how many you really need. Three is city placement, how you can screw or accelerate your growth by placing cities better. Four, granaries, water mills and aqueducts and why they're so good. Five, internal food trade routes and why they are the best thing you can do for growth so try not to send them for any other reason and six tradition and why it's the meta for growing big cities fast tip one the growth window so on quick speed turn 60 to turn 120 or turn 90 to turn 180 on standard speed is what i call the growth window it's the period in time during which your empire is ripe for growth You've just finished getting granaries, libraries and some workers out, and you should be about to have two internal food trade routes built as well. Early in this window is when you'll get civil service, and you'll be getting aqueducts from the tradition finisher if you took tradition, but you'll also be unlocking them soon if you, if you chose liberty. It's also the period where buildings don't take too long to build, so you can actually afford to food focus and not fall behind in your building queue. And you don't yet need to work too many specialists, my opinion has always been that there are actually plenty of ways to get the maximum number of great scientists available to you, even if you start working your scientist slots by the latest turn 105 to turn 110 on quick speed, just because there's some sort of thing about each scientist costing more than the one before it. So, what's important about this window? The, one of the most important things I like to think about is that the window doesn't really move. It's wider on lower difficulty levels, but it doesn't really sometimes move to between turn 70 and turn 130. It's always turn 60 to turn 120 on deity difficulty and on multiplayer if you want to be in a strong position. Now, not meeting the timing means that your position is probably weaker and you'll be in that situation I alluded to earlier, which is chasing the game. And, you know, it's not the worst position to be in when you get like this, but it is useful to know, particularly if you're in a multiplayer game. And sometimes games do just go that way and it's perfectly okay, but you know, this is just to show you what needs to happen to feel you're actually having a strong game. So, we've talked about the growth window, turn 60 to turn 120 on deity difficulty and multiplayer, and you can probably add 10 or 15 turns for each difficulty level you go down. So maybe to turn 130 on Immortal or to turn 140 on Emperor, and so on and so forth. And the result of growing during these windows should be aiming to meet a certain set of benchmarks. These are the benchmarks which I found do quite well for me when I'm playing deity difficulty. So, by turn 100, I aim for 45 population on three cities, and I add five population for each extra city. So 50 population for four cities, and 55 population for five cities. We'll look at it just in this game quickly and see how many we got on our better playthrough as Mongolia. We have 57 population on four cities right now. So we have actually smashed the benchmark. And we get it because we've got 19 in Karakorum, plus 13 is 32, plus 12 is 44, plus 13 is 57. So we smashed that benchmark in this game. And we'll review this on the worst version of this game, the one where we didn't do quite so well. So this is for a good game, the 45 population with three cities and add five. 
for each extra city. Um, but for a strong game, it's also adding another five. So, you know, 45 to 50 population with three cities and 55 population on four cities and 60 population on five cities. So we can see here we got 57 population, which actually meets our strong game benchmark. So this game started to go really well for us. Anyway, more benchmarks by turn 160, this should become 75 population on three cities and you want to add 10 for each additional city. So 85 population on four cities and 95 population on five cities. Remember, these are just a rule of thumb for a strong position. Things can vary depending on what's going on in your game, such as how much jungle you've got, whether or not you've got observatories and that kind of thing. But it's probably worth highlighting now that you know, unless you're the Aztecs who have a ridiculous growth building, three cities is actually quite a weak position and it reinforces the rule I always talk about, which is that more cities is almost always better, probably until you get to about eight. Because to meet the benchmark for three cities, you need to average 25 population across every city by turn 160. Now, how many vanilla maps have you played where you are on a three city empire and you've actually managed to average, well, in fact, how many cities have you found in the average 25 population by turn 160 on quick speed? It's not particularly many. So that's why three cities is not a great position to be in because you need to be having an insane game across all of your cities in order to actually meet that 75 population benchmark. Whereas four cities, you can have your capital at pop 25 and your expansions at pop 20. Now that's an awful lot more common. You know, expansions are quite likely to get to somewhere in and around about the pop 20 region probably between maybe 23 and 17 i would say by around about turn 160 so you can see it starts to get an awful lot easier if you're on four cities whereas on three cities your expansions had to be super good on four cities your expansions only have to be around about average to slightly good and then if we look at the five city benchmark and you do the maths you need a capital at 25 population again we'll anchor our capital on 25 population but this time your expansion's at 17. So again, 17 is slightly, is probably a bit below average now in terms of city size. So you can see why more cities is always better. It's just a lot easier to get your expansions and your capital, frankly, to meet the benchmarks because your cities don't have to be anywhere near as good. Tip two, growth tiles. If you want to have big growth, you need tiles that will have three plus food on them when improved. This is because your city's growth rate is locked to excess food, not total food. So what's the difference between these two? Total food is the amount of food being worked by your city. If we go to our city screen of Karakorum here, we can see that total food and we hover over it. Our total food is 47 base with a whole bunch of modifiers, but we can't really see it. But what determines your city's growth rate is actually your excess food. And that's what we see here next to our food symbol of plus 22.5. Your city's growth rate is wholly determined by excess food. Excess food is what you are working with your citizens or you get from buildings in excess of the amount of food you need to maintain your city at its current population. What do you need to maintain a city at its current population? That is two food per citizen. So that's why working tiles with three plus food is important for growing. Two of that food is required just to maintain that citizen so that extra food on top of two is where your city's growth rate comes from so that's why tiles with three plus food on them are important working two food tiles or one food tiles or zero food tiles will slow your growth rate down whereas working tiles with three or more food will increase your growth rate anyway where do we get these tiles from these tiles come from sea resources civil service farms cattle deer wheat bananas some bison tiles and grassland farms. And a city does need to get most of its food from these tiles and to have access to them as soon as possible so that you can actually make sure to be using that food within the growth window that we talked about earlier. It's actually no good to have all of these tiles, but then not to actually be able to use them in the growth window because then you end up chasing the game, as I called it earlier, whereby you don't grow enough early on. Remember, this is all about growing enough early. And so you actually need to have those three plus food tiles available to work early. And we'll talk about how we make sure to have enough of those early on in a later tip. Now, how many of these tiles do we look for? Typically, I look for 20 to 25 food coming from specifically three plus food tiles. 
So that means you usually need about six to eight or more of them. And then combining those with other tiles that you have that have two food or one food, that gives you a really good chance of growing to about population 20 or pop population 16 plus at the minimum, which we talked about in the previous tip as being kind of around about average or just below average. So what do you do if you've got fewer than probably seven or eight of these three plus food tiles? Well, it means you'll need to send an internal food trade route. You'll have to do something different because leaving the city by itself will probably mean that it starts to become a bit of a liability. Now, one also important thing to say here actually is that if you've got a location that's low food, you should probably make sure that it's got at least something else going for it to make it worth then spending one of your internal food trade routes on that city. So typically, I would say that it has to have several hills or forests for lumber mills because a city really can't be low food and low production. A low food and low production city really is truly a liability. If you've got low food, at least give it good production. And if it's got low production, at least make sure it's got good food. It cannot not have both. Tip three, city placement. If you want to grow your cities early, you need good tiles to work early. That means that you need to make sure that your cities can actually work probably bonus resource tiles early on so that they can get started on the right foot. Why is this important? Well, earlier we talked about how you need tiles with three plus food on them in order to really grow. And that's one important thing, but really super early on in the game, you don't quite need that. Your cities can usually live and die off just the, the city's food and then food from buildings like the granary in order to grow. But what you really need is just good tiles so that you can get your city started. And that typically means bonus resource tiles, not luxury resource tiles, because luxuries, with the exception of maybe salt, only really add gold to the tile that they replace. Whereas salt and bonus resources tend to add either food or production to the tile that they have replaced. If you're not going to be working three plus food, at least be working tiles that have three yield of food and production between them. So sheep with one food and two production, iron hills with three production, grassland horses with two food, one production, wheat with two food, one production, and the list tends to go on. So in order to get a good city started on the right foot, we need to make sure that we can work some bonus resource tiles like this, which brings us on to why city placement is so important. One common mistake is settling a city for, let's say, a third ring resource that just takes ages for your borders to grow to. The classic example is a third ring jungle hill banana. Why is this bad? Because, well, look, the city is going to eventually claim that tile within its borders, but it doesn't start with a third ring jungle hill banana. It starts with just its first ring and then starts expanding out to its second ring and claiming several tiles in the second ring before eventually finding its way out to the third ring. It's bad because, you know, the, the words I used were eventually, you need to have these tiles within the growth window. And if you're you know, in the early game, if you need early game bonus resources to get your cities going, they need to be the second, third, fourth tiles your city claims, if not have them already in their borders to begin with. If you don't have these tiles, you cannot work them, which means you cannot use them to get your cities going in the early game, or you cannot use them in order to grow within the growth window once you get more towards the mid game. When you're placing cities, you need to optimize not just for the total three rings in order to get the best city possible, but you actually also need to optimize for probably the first two rings to make sure that your city has got some great bonus resource tiles to work early on. And it comes back to the point I made right at the start of this video. Poor cities can actually be quite good if you can get them going early and great cities, great end game cities can actually be quite bad and a total liability through most of the game if they don't claim their good tiles early on. And that's just because poor cities that grow fast can often be a lot better during the early and mid game than you know great cities that end up chasing the game and only really catch up once you get to the end. So we need to be claiming our growth tiles early on to make use of our growth window. So let's have a look at some of our cities here to demonstrate how you actually can do that. And maybe Turfan is actually not a bad example. Turfan here has got a reasonably okay first two rings. To be honest, we settled Turfan for Mount Sinai and many a terrible city is settled for Mount Sinai. But in this case, it's probably a reasonable example. Turfan within its three rings actually has some a brilliant amount of food. It's got these three tiles here, this tile, this tile, these two tiles here. And then look at these civil service farms that you're going to get around this lake as well. Now. 
why is turf and not absolutely flying in terms of growth it's because of how many of these tiles are actually on its second and third rings or difficult for the borders to claim we've actually purchased quite a few tiles in turf and and still to date we've only claimed one two three four five six and this one was claimed by the capital but let's say six of our three plus food tiles we still don't have that seven to eight that we were looking for in the previous tip and to get that in fact it's got about nine or even ten overall in turf and but these three tiles are still within you know within the three rings but just totally yet to be claimed and that is because there's a marsh here and then these two tiles are just third ring so it makes them difficult to claim and those tiles even though our city of turfan has probably nine to ten or even eleven three plus food tiles available to it it's currently only working one two three four five six or seven during the growth window and look we're at turn 100 so the growth window is more than 50 percent complete and we haven't claimed these tiles yet and that's why city placement is so important you need to be close to your growth tiles and if you're not close to your growth tiles you're not going to claim all of your third ring growth tiles for your growth window realistically you might claim half or a third of them so it's quite important you know without paying gold for them so it's quite important to make sure that you're settled close to some of the tiles which are most important to you how does cultural border growth work just so that we can maybe talk about why you know when you can let some tiles be third ring and when you can't cultural border growth tends to it it gets slower when you have a feature on the tile that is not a base feature so jungle slows you slows the growth down hill slows the growth down forest slows the growth down and maybe there's a couple of other things that slow the growth down as well so if you need to claim a third ring tile not only is that tile important so is it a hill is it a jungle is it on the other side of a river the other side of a river is one is it a forest which will already slow the border growth down but let's not forget that you also need to claim the second ring tile before that third ring tile before you can claim it so is the second ring tile jungle forest hill across the river all that kind of stuff and so now you can start to see you know why it's often sometimes better just to totally give up a third ring tile in order to claim a better first two rings because sometimes and i'll use the classic example of a third ring luxury that's behind a second ring hill third ring luxuries behind a second ring hill are really difficult to expand to let's look at turfan here in fact second ring hill second ring hill third ring hill we've not even expanded to a second ring hill yet at all and it's turn 100 so if you're trusting your cultural borders to expand to a third ring, this third ring hill here, there's no chance of it happening because of these two hills right here. You'll take ages to grow to these hills and you cannot grow to that third ring tile until you've been past them. So that is why city placement is actually so important. So usually I like to say you need probably 14 to 18 good tiles to make a city you know, decent or good or average, you know, more for better, so on and so forth. And that generally means not coast, not flat tundra not flat desert and not snow within your three rings for a perfectly good city but in keeping with what we've just been talking about i would take 14 over 18 any day to get more of them in my first two rings and you can just work up a, you can just work a couple of specialists to make up the gap i might even go as low as 11 or 12 for a really good first two rings and that is because you need the good tiles early to power the turn 60 to turn 120 growth window and you know not only that but you also need your good bonus resource tiles that we talked about earlier in order to crank out your granary in your library until you can get a worker in to start improving some of those base tiles so realistically the tiles you're going to use to build a granary in your library need to be in your first two rings and that is what gets you started on the right foot or like on the front foot and then you need to make sure to claim those tiles soon enough so that you can actually use them for your growth window and if you can't do either then your city will really struggle and that's why city placement is so important tip four granaries water mills and aqueducts so we talk about these buildings because they are your core food buildings in fact you only have to read the aqueduct description to see how strong they are let's read the description of the aqueduct that's here right now so 40 percent of food is carried over after a new citizen is born which is is really good and in fact it's telling us here apparently with eui that we're getting nine food or is it nine excess food a turn not entirely sure but it's a lot 40 percent of food is carried over when a new citizen is born if you were to take this as a face value that means you only need to get 60 percent of the total excess food you require in order to grow so that really accelerates your growth rate but why are granaries and water mills actually so powerful as well well 
It's because they get your excess food engine going. Well, we talked earlier about how excess food determines growth and growth rate. And even in the mid game, where it's common to have plus 10 excess food, the plus two food from a granary or a water mill can actually be plus 20% growth rate in a city with 10 excess food, right? If I've got a city with 10 excess food without a granary and I build a granary in it, that takes my excess food to 12, that's increased my growth rate by 20%. And if you look in the early game, say something like turn 50, you might have four excess food, let's say. So that plus two is now adding 50% to your growth rate or even 100% if you built both the granary and a water mill. And that's why I normally say it's worth delaying your national college by a few turns, not by that many, right? You can't delay your national college by too far, but if you're not delaying it by that many in order to get a granary up, then it's almost always worth going granary before library in your expands. And that's also because you can actually use that plus two food to work another production tile to get the library done faster. You end up in a situation where you've got your granary done and your library done, whereas you've taken ages building your library and trying to live with the tiles you've got. See, let's have a look at a mid-game example right now while we're thinking about it. We're actually generating, let's fix the tile assignment. We're generating plus 11.5 excess food right now in this city. We have, I believe, a granary and a water mill. So the granary is contributing plus two and the water mill is contributing plus two, which means we'd only actually be at plus seven and a half without the granary and the water mill. That means that our granary and our water mill are together actually adding plus 50% excess food in this city, which is huge. We're growing literally 50% faster. Why else are granaries in particular so good and why they are also kind of important to build before libraries in most of your pre-national college cities is because of sending internal food trade routes which are a real backbone to this growth strategy you need a granary in order to send an internal food trade route from one city to another tip five is internal food trade routes with internal food trade routes is the same argument as the granary or the water mill but even more compelling in the early game pre-national college even plus three food from an internal caravan, which is like the minimum you're ever going to get when you're sending an internal food caravan, could be worth plus 75% or even plus 150% growth rate, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it. Even in the mid game, when in fact right now, I believe they're worth plus four and a half food right now in it, on turn 100, that plus four and a half food is currently worth more than 50% of our growth rate or would be currently worth more than 50%. No, actually not in this city, it's kind of not important. But let's go to somewhere like Turfan where it's happening. Yeah, we're getting plus four and a half food in this city. And that is actually adding just probably about 40 to 50% growth rate in this city right now. So that is a ridiculous amount of growth from an internal food caravan. In fact, right now, the internal caravan is worth more than a granary and a water mill combined. And we just talked about how powerful they are in our previous tip. So they are incredible, these internal food caravans. So you really should build all of your internal food caravans as soon as you can. And you should tech specifically for them. And your cities are really going to thank you for this. What does it really mean in practice then? So how do we get these internal food caravans? Let's go to the tech tree. We get one at animal husbandry. Animal husbandry is like a no brainer in the early game. So you're always going to have that. You get your second one at sailing. And so this actually means that if you are landlocked, you really should tech sailing. And if you are landlocked, you should also pretty much always tech sailing before you take philosophy for your national college. So that, you know, that's a really early timing in order to tech sailing, especially if you're not, if you're not used to doing it. But this internal food caravan is 100% worth it. Sending that will make a big difference to whichever city you send it. And if you don't take sailing, you'll only have one caravan and that really is not going to be enough at all. So even if you're landlocked, take sailing before you take philosophy for National College so you can get that second internal food trade route. Similarly, here's engineering. Engineering is your next internal food trade route. This one you can't really take before your National College or before you take philosophy, but there is an argument for basically flipping a coin between whether or not you go for civil service after philosophy or whether or not you go for engineering after philosophy. Civil service because you get the civil service farm improvement and then engineering because you would want this internal food trade route. And which one you go for kind of depends on how many civil service farms you're gonna think you're gonna get improved. Now, we should probably think a little bit differently about engineering and this engineering trade route for the purposes of discussing the civil service farm. One internal food trade route in the classical era is going to be worth, it's either plus three or plus four food. 
I think it might be plus, plus four, plus three. Can't remember. Something like that, plus three or plus four. Now, let's not think about it like a plus three or a plus four food tile because that is kind of not a good way to think about it because let's remember a plus four food tile actually needs to be worked by a citizen. So that plus four food tile is actually only contributing plus two food to your excess growth because there's the two food for using the citizen that's actually having to work it. Whereas the internal caravan does not require a citizen to work it at all. So it is genuine excess food. And if you compare it to civil service, how does it stack up? Well, let's take plus four food from the trade route and then look at civil service. Civil service adds food from farm by one for each tile. So really this internal caravan, as long as you build it, as soon as you tech it, is gonna be worth four civil service farms. So here is a way that you can judge whether or not you should go civil service first or engineering first. Are you going to get four or more civil service farms improved by the time you get to civil service? If not, you should probably go for engineering first and build the trade route. But if you can get, let's say, five or more civil service farm tiles improved before you get to civil service, then it might be a good time to go for civil service before engineering. But let's also remember that it's not actually often that you get that many civil service farm tiles improved by the time you get to civil service. And if you really work hard to get that done, you might end up giving up improving things like horses, iron, sheep, other tiles which desperately need improving in the early game. In fact, production is pretty super important in the early game. So you should improve most of your production tiles first. And so often engineering is probably the better play than civil service. And in fact, depending on how many workers you've ended up with, metal casting before civil service can often be a good idea too. And let's rewind a moment because we need to think about coastal versus non-coastal. Well, if you're coastal, internal food trade routes are doubled. So the yield you get from gold or from production or from food on an internal trade route is actually double what you get inland. And we've been talking about inland trade routes so far. So you know, here on engineering, your internal food cargo ship is going to be worth, what's that, like six or eight food? So that's now worth either six or eight civil service farms improved. If you've got a coastal empire, you might not have that many civil service farms in your entire empire, let alone just within a sink, you know, within two or three cities. So as a coastal player, unless you want Chichen Itza, taking engineering first for the cargo ship is almost always the better play. And again, because you get so few civil service farms as coastal, taking metal casting first can often work out quite well. In fact, a lot of the very best SIP players that I personally watch almost always go metal casting before civil service, regardless of inland, regardless of river, etc., because of how powerful that trade route is, but actually also just because of how powerful the workshop is. So you really should be sending your internal trade routes for food. There are just better ways to get things like gold and things like production that people commonly send them for. Just, you know, build a market if you need gold or work it or send the food caravan and work a luxury tile. You know, try your very, very best to send a food caravan and then work more production tiles or send a food caravan and work more gold tiles than working food tiles and sending gold or production caravans because switching these tiles over you'll probably still get an increase to your growth rate by sending food and working production as opposed to sending production and working food you'll probably you don't need that much you know production or gold so it's often better to send for the food and then work what you can of the other one and get a bit of that net growth rate going and again it tells us why coastal growth is so ludicrously good because the internal cargo ships are doubled you've got a variety of growth tools that we've outlined as part of this guide but internal food trade routes are really the best of all of them particularly cargo ships and I guess as a passing note, now we see why world wonders like Colossus and Petra are so powerful, in addition to the other broken way that Petra is ludicrously good, because you actually get an extra one of these trade routes. That's another internal food caravan or cargo ship that you can send. And as we talked about, these are just simply the best things that you can send to accelerate your growth rate. In addition, we should probably just quickly talk about workers. Workers help improve your tiles. You know, we talked about how the granary was so good because it provides plus two food and then it does add food to your wheat or deer or you know some other tiles. But in fact, it's just wheat or deer. But 
workers can add plus one food to as many tiles as they can possibly do, right? In fact, we looked at all these tiles right now. Worker added two food, worker added two food, worker added two food, worker added two food, worker added one food. Workers are really great for improving tiles. And in fact, one low key super important thing to make a really good city is to have it only work improved tiles and you only work improved tiles by having workers. And so a good rule of thumb that I tend to use is two workers per city and that's what a lot of the top players that i watch use as their rule of thumb two workers per city commonly you might have read somewhere that you need number of number of cities equals number of workers plus one or plus two or maybe 1.5 workers per city 1.5 workers per city should be called the bare minimum i really do love to aim for two and that tends to mean that you can have your cities working all improved tiles as soon as possible which is just huge for improving the quality of your city surprise tip that i didn't intend to add to the video today but it's one that is actually probably equally important as some of the some of the others that we talked about workers try to get two per city treat one and a half per city as the absolute minimum so i would say six or even seven would be the absolute minimum for this empire and in fact we've got one two three four five six seven right now so we're at our absolute minimum and then eight would be optimal for our four cities and let's have a look at this actually while we're here so we're working all improved tiles in the capital we're working almost all improved tiles in Beshbalik. we're working all improved tiles in turfan and we're working actually not too many improved tiles in hasea i guess because we've been waiting for these jungle tiles jungle tiles i guess are a bit of an exception but as we can see with our seven workers we're actually just about working all improved tiles in every city and we're doing that during our growth window if we had six or five workers if we were doing number of cities plus one or 1.5 per city quite a lot of the we'd you know we're just about scraping working all improved tiles in all of these cities if we had any fewer workers we would certainly be an awful lot further behind you have to give up something if you don't have enough workers and that's making sure that you've at least got more than one and a half per city you either have to give up working improved tiles or you have to give up having roads connected and roads are pretty critical for your gold per turn so you can see where workers are just so so powerful having workers allows you to work all improved tiles and you know let's say you're working a two food grassland tile versus a three food grassland farm that's plus one food in Beshbalik right now plus one food would be plus 10 percent growth rate even even something as simple as getting two food to three food can be really really big for your growth rate because it's plus 10 percent so there we go this was tip five and a bonus tip about the workers internal food trade routes finally tip six which is tradition or you know tradition versus liberty or some kind of combination about that but basically why tradition is good so tradition no other policy tree gives you growth from its policies so let's take a look at what we get from tradition so in tradition we get plus 10 percent growth and plus two food in the capital we talked about earlier how the plus two food from a granary regardless of its effect on wheat and deer is actually quite big for your growth rate and not only this but when you finish tradition you get plus 15 percent growth in all of your cities and you get a free aqueduct in your first four cities and we talked about it earlier how powerful the aqueduct is and it's really important to point out now traditions free aqueduct does not require you to have researched engineering in order to get them you get a traditions free aqueduct regardless of whether or not you have researched engineering although however as we spoke about in one of my previous tips it's actually a pretty good idea to research engineering anyway, definitely before universities. So you're going to be researching engineering a lot of the time anyway, but it's just to remember you don't actually need engineering in order to get traditions free aqueducts. But also on top of that is something that we haven't talked about yet, which is faster border growth. And specifically, I believe it refers to border growth in the capital, but there might be some border growth elsewhere in tradition. I forget whether or not we actually have any. We perhaps don't, but we do have faster border growth in the capital because of the plus three culture, but also because legalism provides a free culture building in your first four cities, which generally always means monuments, although sometimes it's an aqueduct in your capital. So why is that important? Well, in our tip three and our tip two, which is the growth tiles and our tip about city placement, getting tiles within your borders in time for the growth window really matters. 
So if you get increased border growth by getting a free monument straight away in your expansions or traditions plus three culture in your capital, that accelerates your border growth in order to claim all of your best tiles earlier, which has more of them available for your growth window. You'll finish tradition probably between turn maybe 65 to 73, something like that, just after you finish your National College. And after that, you'll have every single thing that we just talked about in tradition. So it is all available throughout almost all of the growth window. And that's why the meta is so good as tradition. Although one thing that I probably do want to point out now, and that's why I made this this sixth tips kind of like tradition or tradition versus liberty or something like that, because we do need to talk about cities. So people commonly think that four cities is what you found as tradition and no more. And that's just because you know the bonuses in tradition, you get free culture building in your first four cities so that's your capital in your first three expansions and you also get the free aqueduct in your first four cities so that's your capital and your first three expansions people often get a bit confused and think that that means that you shouldn't settle any more than four as tradition because you don't get any bonuses in those extra cities but it's best not to think about it like that it's better to think about tradition makes your first four cities uber powerful and then your Extra cities you settle after that just don't start with the same ridiculous bonuses. People might say, or you might have mistakenly thought, don't feel, don't found any more cities than four as tradition. I would say that's wrong. You absolutely can found more cities as tradition. You might not get the free aqueducts at the monuments, but you do still get the plus 15% growth rate, and you do still get free aqueducts and free monuments in your first four. The thing about it is that this tradition settling, probably only going up to four cities before National College makes sense, because otherwise your fifth city will need to build monuments and granaries and libraries without help. But you can go past four cities to five, six, seven, and maybe even eight as tradition. You still get the plus 15% growth rate in those extra cities. And tradition actually has more happiness than liberty up to at least eight cities. In fact, you might end up with more happiness if you even settled nine cities. So that's kind of why tradition is so good and you can continue to found cities past four as tradition, but maybe only settle your initial three expansions before your national college and then grab the rest after. And that's why again, people say six cities minimum, but you really need seven or more for liberty. And that's just because, you know, liberty or piety or honor for that matter, they need more cities growing to keep up with tradition. If you settle the same number of cities as a tradition player, you're gonna have the same everything but you won't have 15% growth rate and you won't have the plus 10% growth rate in your capital, the plus two food, the earlier aqueducts and the earlier monuments, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the list kind of keeps going on. So Liberty needs to settle lots of cities in order to make up for not having those growth bonuses. So that's something that you need to remember. So Liberty needs six cities minimum, but really seven or more, to be honest. Six city Liberty tends to be a bit of a sad Liberty because you just need those extra cities in order to keep up your growth rate. And that's because of the earlier thing we talked about before we got into the tips, which is more cities is always better, where we said that it's so much easier to get your cities to good population to meet good benchmarks if you have five cities, because your average population across all of your cities needs to be lower. And that's something you have to take advantage of as Liberty. And in fact, you need to settle a lot of those cities before the National College, probably, because Again, tradition can easily settle its extra cities after National College. So if you want to be getting those extra cities as liberty and you want to really make use of them, you have to try and crank down quite a few of them before your National College as well, which is what makes playing liberty so much more difficult. I would say the only constraint on tradition and founding cities tends to be probably don't found more than eight, to be honest, and try not to found more than probably three or four expansions before National College and then just settle the rest of your expansions after because otherwise you delay your National College too long. And that liberty, you know, it's not a bad tree, but you know, it's a strong tree. It's a strong tree in its own right. In fact, it's you know it has better production and better culture than tradition does for the same number of cities. It's just that it doesn't get the growth, and on the base maps, there you often don't get a lot of room to settle those liberty cities, which is why you often see a lot of good players just instinctively click on tradition as their opener. And if they decide they do want to do liberty, then they just switch to liberty afterwards and just take that one point in tradition as a bit of a hit. There. I think brings us to the end of, I guess, the six quick tips with the bonus thing about workers to growing big cities fast and early. So as a recap, what we talked about is the growth window between turn 60 to turn 120 on deity difficulty. Needing to grow, needing to get at least 20 to 25 food from tiles with three or more food when improved for cities to reach a respectable size. So you're talking six, probably seven 
plus of those tiles. And if you have fewer, it's not a problem, but you just have to know that it will need a food trade route sent to it. And if it's low food, at least make sure to get that city to have good production. Our third, which was city placement. So growth tiles are no good if you're not working them during the growth window. That means placing cities to claim growth tiles within the first two rings. And, you know, it's absolutely better to give up a third ring bonus resource to stay closer to your growth tiles. Our fourth was just talking about how good granaries, watermills, and aqueducts are and how they are worth, you know, 50 to 100% excess food and therefore growth rate in the early game. So you really should build them with highest priority. Our fifth tip was talking about internal food trade routes, which are simply the best tool for growing big cities early. There are just better ways to get gold better ways to get production so try to send every single one of your trade routes as early as possible and to tech specifically for them we talked about how sailing is 100 worth getting before you even tech philosophy even when you're landlocked purely for the trade route and about how teching engineering before civil service can actually be quite a good play if you don't think you're going to get maybe five or more civil service farms online by the time you get to civil service and instead tech engineering for the additional trade route because we talked about how how that food kind of stacks up against civil service and then we did quickly talk about workers and how all of the best players that i watch go for two workers per city and that's because your cities are just immeasurably better by working all improved tiles and that's why workers are so good. So try and get up to two per city and definitely try to have gotten there probably by turn 80. Now we're on turn 100 right now. We've got seven workers for four cities, which is almost enough, but not quite. But that's just because we had probably a couple of early workers, I think, in this playthrough. But generally, you're looking to get your two workers per city up a lot earlier than that to make sure that your cities are working all improved tiles as soon as possible. Genuinely, it makes a huge difference. And then finally, we talked about our sixth tip, sixth tip, tradition, and why it's the meta, how its growth bonuses and happiness simply beat anything else you can get in every tree. And it's so good. You're not even limited to four cities. You can happily go up to six, seven, or even eight with tradition. Just make sure to found, you know, maybe four expands or fewer before National College so as not to wreck your capital and not to get your National College done too late. Now, I promise to show you how this empire looks if we don't really follow the tips. We follow the tips here, we got 57 population, which as I said earlier, is actually two population more than the strong benchmark for four cities. Let's move on to the not so good playthrough where we're not meeting that. Here is the promised worst playthrough earlier where we didn't follow through in a lot of the tips that we talked about that we followed in order to get the previous save up to a respectable, well, in fact, a very strong amount of population. Here, let's have a look at our population. So first of all, it's 50. So we've actually hit the good timing as it happens given our turn 100 benchmarks but what's probably important to demonstrate the difference between the previous iteration of the save where things were going really well and then this version of the save where things aren't going particularly good first of all let's note a few key differences Karakorum is three population smaller in fact it's 50 between between 50 and 57 population so 57 population is actually over 10 percent in fact it's what 12 percent extra population so that's the first thing we have to remember 12 percent extra population our science on the previous save we had about 160 odd science here we've actually only got 117 and in terms of technology we are currently researching compass whereas in the previous iteration we had finished compass and we had finished machinery and were researching physics so our tech is five turns behind our population is about 12 percent behind and our building queues are miles behind in the previous iteration with 57 pop, we already have universities in Turfan and Tasia, and I believe we've also we've also finished this Circus Maximus, and we're able to research or build the Forbidden Palace in our capital. In here, I'm not entirely sure where the Forbidden Palace has gone. Actually, in fact, we haven't even opened patronage in this scenario, but we would have been able to build the Forbidden Palace if we wanted it. But we'll also note why is this different. Well, let's have a look at why this is different. Oh, in actual fact, let's think about why getting behind is so bad you might think 50 to 57 part you know not a bad difference you know it's possible but let's have a look at why it's so bad first of all our production is kind of shot in a lot of our cities our production is just a lot less and that's because we're one or two population points smaller because our cities are smaller we're having to work go even harder on food in order to grow these cities because we need to catch up right you know, where our cities were, you know, where we had seven population more across our whole, whole empire in the previous save, we were able to work more production because our cities don't need to be growing as hard in order to hit benchmarks. Where we got off to a slower start here, we actually need to be working more food than in the other save in order to grow our cities at a respectable rate 
And that means that we have to work less production. So we're behind in population, and now we have to work less production in order to catch up in population, which is a bit of a self-defeating cycle because it puts us miles behind our building queues. This city here was done with a university and it could build things like banks faster because we were further along in our tech tree. Same with Hesea, it was done with a university. We were actually even improving these jungle tiles right now in order to get gold on them as well as science. And you know we had some of these other buildings done as well, I think, and again, being able to build them faster. Now let's assess our worker situation. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've actually got the same seven workers, but we've got one fewer trade route currently going. And in fact, it's the equivalent of two fewer trade routes because we're currently sending gold to Leventa and we did that for a city-state quest. That's a common way to use your trade routes in the early game if you're not really thinking too hard about what you're doing. So instead of in the previous save where we've got four internal food trade routes, this time around we only have two and it hurts. It hurts in a big, big way because we've got seven population fewer right now, we've got lower production, and we even have almost lower food. And so our empire is playing catch up, but it just doesn't have a lot of tools to do it with. And that's how you can see that, you know, this early population really matters. Being at 57 as opposed to 50 was huge for our empire. Karakorum is ahead of its production queue and blitzing out buildings in the previous save, whereas it's still building a caravan right now here and it hasn't even built its artist guild. So that's just showing how different the game can get when you're not following the tips that we talked about earlier. In this game, we didn't really, we followed some, but not all. And so we got a good number, but this empire could have been so much better, which just goes to show how important it is. And lastly, one final thing to add from me, I've decided to record an impromptu over explain game, going through all of the tips that we've just gone, been through in this guide to try and show you over explained in a way how to implement all of the tips that we just talked about in a way that will allow you to meet the population benchmarks that we talked about. So not only showing this example game, but we've got another game as Mongolia where we have quite a low food start and we managed to transform that into meeting the benchmarks that we see. Do check out that video, it's down as part two, it's part of the next section of this playlist. Do check it out if you enjoyed this guide. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it helps to help you all grow all of your cities as tall as you can, as early as you can, to start the snowball of production equals science and science win games, and population is production, and production makes winning games so much easier, showing how poor cities can actually be quite strong, especially through the early and mid game if you grow them early, and how good cities, you know, this is an empire with lots of potential, can actually be quite bad through the early, mid and sort of getting towards the late game because you got them off on the wrong foot or not what they are able to be. As always, any comments, feedback and yeah, I guess I, I'll comments again, um, encouraged in the comment section below. Please do like this video if you like it. It really helps others find this video and really helps your channel or really helps your channel, really helps this channel. And if you want to know when I upload new videos, playthroughs, stream recordings, day to day games, etc, etc, hit the subscribe button too. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye for now.